Today's video is sponsored by NordVPN. Get four free months and 73% off a two-year plan at the link at the top of the description. Emirates and Qatar Airways are among the world's largest international airlines, both operating fleets of hundreds of wide-body aircraft to destinations on all inhabited continents. Yet their strategies, specifically their fleets, couldn't be more different. And that is what today's video will focus on. If you'd like me to delve into other differences between the airlines, let me know in the comments. Emirates famously operates an incredibly simple fleet. They only fly Boeing 777s and Airbus A380s, with over 100 of each type. That is pretty remarkable given how many cities they fly to. Meanwhile, Qatar Airways operates almost every aircraft type that's available on the market, with as few as three of a single type like the Airbus A321. With Qatar Airways and, and Emirates, you look at their different models and you see that they have a similar route network in terms of the, the world that they serve, a similar mission in terms of wanting to uh, fly the world's passengers through their respective hubs, but then you have totally different strategy. This is a dramatic difference on the surface, but there are also some interesting reasons that make both their strategies surprisingly similar. Let's find out why they chose these different paths and what makes them two sides of the same coin. Both Emirates and Qatar Airways are so-called super connectors, creating a global hub in their respective home cities that connect billions of people, primarily between Europe, Asia, and Africa. Operating this type of airline requires significant scale, and with each destination or seat added, other destinations are enabled as well. Think of it this way, there is naturally quite little demand for travel from Barcelona to Doha. Now, if you add a flight from Doha to Bangkok, the number of people who are interested in the Barcelona to Doha flight will increase, since they can now connect onwards. If you then add Singapore, you'll have a few more people who are interested in flying from Barcelona to Doha, and so on. With each added destination and each additional seat available, these airlines expand the interest in their overall network since they have more reach. This is self-explanatory, but it's fascinating to think just how different strategies these airlines took to achieve that goal. Emirates chose to have higher capacity while serving slightly fewer destinations. They prioritize economies of scale by putting one, two, or even three daily A380s on many routes to enable mass transit of passengers between cities all over the world. In Dubai, you could have 20 or even 30 a 3 80s arriving within one hour, resulting in tens of thousands of passengers flooding Dubai's terminals before continuing onward. In case something went wrong, passengers would barely notice, since there would be plenty of other A380s to substitute with. What are the benefits of this type of simple fleet? Well, they are numerous. Having many of the same aircraft decreases the marginal maintenance and purchasing cost. Buying 100 airplanes is far cheaper per frame than buying 10. Similarly, buying spare parts is much cheaper when you buy in bulk. In essence, this is the low-cost way of doing things, as we see at Ryanair or Southwest, but obviously applied to a full-service airline like Emirates. Another benefit is consistency from a passenger perspective. You never have to worry about an equipment change and know you are getting one type of seat on the A380 and on the 777, besides some minor changes in upholstery. This has helped Emirates with their powerful branding, especially with their A380 first class and onboard shower suites. However, Emirates' strategy has been regularly criticized by analysts and others in the aviation industry for being high risk, high reward. But it worked pretty well until recently. Emirates bet everything on the A380, Qatar Airways did not. And so what you see on the west side, which is Doha, you see a you know, variation of fleet to be able to pick apart and send a 320 to Hyderabad when demand needs only a 320, but also put on an A350 to Riyadh in Saudi Arabia, because while there may not be the biggest leisure market, actually there are a lot of pilgrims making their way to Mecca and so on. 
So you have that versatility and that flexibility there. For Emirates, they don't have that because they did bet on the A380. They bet on that mass market travel that we know has been decimated and worsened by the pandemic, but they have no choice but to continue. So Emirates' strategy unsurprisingly became a weak point and probably a major regret in light of the pandemic. But few airlines follow the same strategy as Qatar Airways. In fact, on the surface, their strategy of operating almost every aircraft that's available to them is confusing. They don't benefit from bulk discounts in the same way and they increase their complexity enormously. Just on the staff side, they need cabin crew and pilots for each aircraft type. And although many cabin crew can operate two, three, or even four different types of aircraft, this makes staffing so much more complicated. For most airlines, they want to narrow in on an aircraft type that works for them. As we know with Qatar Airways and with airlines of that size, that isn't always the most important thing. So let's look at why. Firstly, if you look at that route network, this is a genuinely global route network, not just in reach, but in a variation of market types. You've got the ultra long haul markets, you have secondary cities, you have markets that require frequency, but not necessarily capacity. And when you begin to understand just how varied that market is, you can very easily pinpoint certain aircraft type to certain key areas of that market. It's not necessarily as inefficient as it may seem on the surface. If you think about, for example, their long, thin routes like Krabi, like Penang, these kind of destinations, you can clearly see how something like a 777 isn't needed, but definitely something with the versatility of a 321neo slash a 787 would work really well there. Then you go to the opposite end of the spectrum. You look at Seattle, ultra long haul, extremely far from Doha. You look at Melbourne, and these are capacity at least before the pandemic, capacity-driven routes that require big engines, lots of fuel for efficient ultra-long haul operations. So then you have somewhere in the airline for those aircraft. And then of course, you've got the routes that are not necessarily so far away from Doha, so six, seven, eight hours, but that are high capacity, high demand markets that will be required at least minimum of a two, three daily service you know, every day of the year, regardless to seasonality. And so how can you make that work with larger aircraft, with a good service on board, but also with their cargo needs that go to and from that? So you're looking at the 350s and the 777s. And very quickly, you see, I've just gone through almost every aircraft type available to Qatar Airways that they have included into the fleet and that they can make work. Qatar Airways have this, this variation of aircraft that allows them to be able to adapt very quickly to whatever climate they are facing, be it a recession, be it a global pandemic, be it a Gulf crisis blockade that occurred in the region. Being able to be agile and adapt is much more powerful than betting everything on, on one aircraft type. And we've seen this throughout the pandemic. When the pandemic hit, Qatar Airways immediately grounded the 320s because they didn't have any cargo ability and so few passengers were flying and they called it a day on the A380s because this was an aircraft that was ultimately inefficient before the pandemic, not least after. So then they narrow in, okay, what works? The 350 and 777, it can carry passengers and a lot of them if there is demand, but also they can almost bet everything on cargo during that demand. So we, we see evidence of the agile and the adapting nature of an airline that has a variety of aircraft in times of crises and look no further than the pandemic. So Qatar Airways knew this all along and had the perfect strategy, right? Well, as always, there is more to the story. Both airlines have notable order histories for another reason, and this is where they are more similar than it appears. For Emirates, being the world's largest operator of the 777 and the A380 is about more than efficiency and scale. Being the world's biggest operator of the world's biggest airplane is naturally a matter of prestige. Qatar Airways is not the largest operator of any aircraft type by the same margin, but they have another way of generating this all-important prestige. If I reach 500,000 subscribers this year, don't forget that I'm bringing three of you with me on a flight in Qatar Airways Q Suite. So if you haven't subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? Dan, you know that this is an airline that is 
loyal to both of the largest manufacturers. So when you look at that loyalty that Qatar Airways have to both Boeing and Airbus, and then you look at how they are very often the launch customer for any new aircraft that they bring onto the market. More often than not, it used to be when dispatch reliability of aircraft could have been a bit sketchy in the, when we didn't have the technology that we have today. That used to be a risk that most airlines wanted to avoid. Nobody wanted to be first. We've seen that change over the last decade, whereby being first is being perceived as this kind of attractive, loyalist to the manufacturer, whereby you're able to introduce the best of what's new onto the market and get it into passengers' hands faster. We are closely watched, closely followed, and closely monitored by our peers in the industry because we are quite simply always breaking new territory. A very strong vision has been set with a very clear mandate for Qatar Airways to be the best in the world. So as you can tell, there are different elements that contribute to this sense of importance. But prestige is definitely a contributor to both airlines' fleet strategies. Now, there's one more thing they have in common. Looking at their fleets and their orders, they are both almost evenly split between Airbus and Boeing, which is quite rare. We can't escape the fact in aviation that Airbus is a huge representation, almost a, a, an aviation ambassador to Europe and the European Union, and Boeing alike to the United States. So what this does geopolitically is it gives big airlines with spending power the ability to time their orders depending on the current political climate. Look no further than when uh, Trump was in office and the US carriers were complaining about the Middle Eastern airlines and the subsidies that they get. Well, what did we see? We saw Qatar Airways go to the White House with the Emir of Qatar, placing those orders for Gulfstream jets and for engines for their Boeing 777Xs. And what do we know happened on that day in the White House? We saw that conversation take place where President Trump was informed, look, this is unfair to have the Middle East slammed a state subsidy. You see it yourself with the subsidies that American airlines and US airlines in general receive. And so can you ask them to perhaps come to the table and let's talk about this like adults? We know because it's been widely reported that Trump did just that. He did speak to the US carriers and, and told them to hold off on their ultimately what became slander to, to Middle Eastern airlines a few months later. We have a deal. American Airlines, Qatar Airways, they have a code share agreement, an interline agreement. They are friends again. Americans say that they are going to start a service to Doha, which will be very interesting. So, you know, you see how there are big political considerations that can go in, not necessarily to the order itself, but definitely to the timing of those orders, yeah. Business has always been political, and with controversial airlines like those from the Gulf states, orders can be powerful tools of diplomacy and bringing forth wishes either in Europe or the US. Now, as we saw, the pandemic taught us that perhaps Qatar Airways has the better strategy of the two, but is theirs really optimal? That is almost impossible for us to answer, but we can look to similar airlines for clues. Turkish Airlines and Singapore Airlines could both be classed as somewhat similar airlines to Qatar Airways. They all have a strong focus on connecting traffic, although Turkish and Singapore have a slightly higher proportion of passengers to their hubs than Qatar. Looking at these airlines, we see the same split in terms of fleet. All three operate A350s together with 787s, which is so far rare in Europe and the US. They also operate narrow bodies, with Turkish flying both the 737 MAX and the A321neo. All three also operate the 777 and the A330 in some forms. This tells us that perhaps simpler isn't always better. As much as I and all other frequent flyers love Emirates for their fleet of massive aircraft, especially the A380, it seems flexibility and diversification, although more expensive, pays off in the long run. And when it comes down to the difference between the two airlines, it seems they've both found their niche. Emirates wants to have the most and the biggest, while Qatar Airways wants to have the newest and the flashiest, two different strategies that turn out to be driven by similar desires, resulting in two fascinating airlines for all us airplane lovers out there. 
Before you go, let me make a quick analogy. Having such a diverse fleet kind of offers Qatar Airways the same protection against problems as NordVPN does for its customers. Let me explain. NordVPN is a leading VPN that helps you protect yourself from harm online, whether through stolen data or malware. Not only that, but NordVPN unlocks content or services that aren't available in your country, which can be especially useful if you have any flights with Middle Eastern carriers coming up. Their hub countries block all types of content and services including Skype and FaceTime, which you can gain access to using NordVPN. The best part? You can try them out at a 73% discount on a two-year plan, with four months free and be confident in your purchase with their 30-day money-back guarantee. Go to nordvpn.com slash nonstopdan or tap the link at the top of the description to learn more. Thanks as always for supporting my sponsors guys and until I see you all next time, fly safe.